everyone. Welcome to Wild on Design, presented by the Pacific Design Center. I'm Jennifer Convey. I'm your host. I'm also the director of Women in Luxury Design. Today, we are so excited to welcome a dear friend and incredibly talented interior designer. Oh, can't wait to get to it. Timothy Corrigan is here today. He is one of the world's leading interior designers with offices in Los Angeles and Paris. And his firm has completed projects in all over Europe, Asia, the Middle East, across the United States. His firm specializes in really elegant, comfortably uh, outfitted interior design and incorporates antiques into most of his projects. And it's stunning, every single one of them. His clients include royalty, Hollywood celebrities, and corporate leaders. He has been named to virtually every top designer list, including Architectural Digest, AD100, El Decor A-List, Rob Report's uh, Top 40 Designers in the World, the Lux Gold List, and of course, the Pacific Design Center Star of Design. It goes on and on and on. He is the only American honored by the French Heritage Society for his restoration of several national landmarks in France. The firm's work has been featured in over, now get this, 1,000 publications worldwide. Where does he have the time? <laughs> I don't think I've ever said those words. I don't think that is true of anybody else. So congrats to him. Timothy has designed and licensed many collections for a wide range of luxury products for perennials, Schumacher, Samuel and Sons, and more. And we're going to learn all about it. Also, he has two best-selling books and a third one on the way by Rizzoli. I mean, very impressive. Anyway, we're going to learn so much today. Please welcome Timothy Corrigan. Hi, dear. Hey, how are you? It's so good to see you again. It's Thank wonderful. you. It's so good to see you, too. <laughs> it's been, it's been oh, my a crazy, goodness. crazy couple of years, hasn't it? Yes. Now, how have you been? I want to hear, I know a little bit, but you know, because you're in the news all the time, all those periodicals and publications um, and social media, my goodness. So I'm up on you and um, I just tell everyone what it was like, you know, when the world shut down. Um, I know you're always busy with projects, but how did that affect your business? How was that for you? Well, you know, it was interesting because uh, I was determined that I was not going to let it uh, affect our business. I, I spent the first two weeks basically just talking to calling every client we have around the world and getting a sense of temperature reading from them to say, hey, how are things going for you? What, how do you see the future of this? And, and how do you want to proceed in terms of your jobs? Because I think it's really important that you um, that you really try to fit the needs of your clients. And it was interesting because literally with the exception of one big project, um, which did get put, put on hold, we proceeded as if business was totally as normal. Um, I went into the office every single day during that, that entire shutdown period. Fortunately, I'm, I'm close enough to, to my office so I could even just walk here. I was the person manning the everything, sort of answering the door, answering the telephone. Just, Get it, just me, everyone else was working um, remotely from home. Uh, Safe, but uh, that was a long three months where where I thought I cannot wear every hat and continue to do all that, <laughs> but I did. Um, and uh, and then fortunately enough, our offices are such that everyone has their own office. Uh, we have windows that can open, et cetera. So once it sort of that that first shutdown happened, we actually all returned to office, which was really lovely. Um, we all were wearing masks, uh, mm -hmm. but once we would you know in our own office, we could take them off, and, and we kept all the windows open um, all through last winter. We kept the windows open um, and and the heat on so that we had the airflow. Um, so we were really able to to maintain. And then once people got vaccinated, um, we were able to sort of uh, a month after the last person did, we were able to take off our masks. Uh, we still have the windows open. And, and so it really has been um, it's it's really been fine for us. It's been it's been uh, a, a great opportunity to um, get off the airplane that I was uh, all the time. I think I was. I, I travel around 75% of the time because we've got projects going on everywhere. Um, that was lovely to not be on the airplane. The I bet. Yeah. I bet. Beautiful home, beautiful office. So wait a minute, let me get this straight. So you never stopped working and you only had three months of 
isolation in your office though by yourself yes, while the team exactly. worked remotely um yeah you're you're very very fortunate and we're all fortunate that we if we're going to have the windows open for safety and airflow that we live winter in southern california so right. you know, I, I understand the people a lot of people in new york are still not back because their buildings are not you know structured in a way that they can open windows and i even have friends here uh who are in buildings where they can't open the windows and that is it's a real issue then but i, yeah. I feel so lucky that we have that Oh, it, you are lucky and it couldn't happen to a better person. Um, I know, you know, it's true. It's actually the industry and building and architecture is going to change radically. It already has in exactly this, you know, airflow, safety, filters, all that stuff, circulation, light, all of that. Um, very interesting. How, during this period of time, did you experience a shift either from your clients in the industry as a whole, your practices beyond the safety measures? Well, it's interesting because we've we've always worked um, a lot internationally. So we, we, we'd we gotten used to doing Zoom meetings and things like that beforehand. And I actually find for some things, particularly when you're dealing with architecture, um, a, a Zoom mm -hmm. meeting actually forces you all to become much more focused because you're all looking at that exact same plan. And if you're making marks on that plan, you're all seeing that. So. Yeah. Uh, from a perspective of, of 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 architecture, I think Zoom is actually a great tool. Um, but as I say, we've been we've been doing that all along. We're, we're currently working um, in six different countries um, around the world. Here in the United States, we're working in nine different states right now. Uh, you know, so um, uh, we're, we we really have to be able to figure out ways to work well at a distance so that you're not always uh, on an airplane. Right, right. Um, oh, by the way, I hope this is okay to bring up because we had a lovely chat while I was in traffic trying to stay safe and concentrate. Um, but we had a few laughs. And while we were talking, there was a certain celebrity client's team calling you and heard the whole conversation on another line. And you said, oh, I'm so sorry. It was so-and-so. Would you please share if that's okay? I'd be delighted to. It was uh, the wonderful actress Sofia Vergara, who is truly one of the most delightful, the sweetest, most fun, most uh, really I incredible persons um, that I've ever worked with, I've been ever lucky enough to work with. Um, she's got great taste and she's so much fun. But she was calling because we were having some landscaping issues and she was calling from the set in London and, and uh, we, you know, we were dealing with it, but it's, you know, it's, it's, so it's glamorous. Always, it's, it's, it's always fun to have to have clients like that who who uh, take things in their stride. And I think someone like that really does. Right. That's fantastic. She seems like she's just the most terrific person. So it's always nice to hear somebody confirm that who actually knows. Absolutely. And she does have good taste because she hired you. <laughs> Can you tell us anything about the aesthetic? Was there something different that you're doing with her that you're excited about? Um, you know, we're, we're, it's a it's a it's a uh, a big house in, um, that needed a total redo. So we're we're completely we've stripped. A, I think it's a it's a, a more than fifteen thousand square foot house that we're just totally redoing from top to bottom uh, with every sort of surface being redone, et cetera. But it's uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be really fabulous. So I'm hoping looking forward to being oh. able to share it with people uh, when it's done in the new year. We can't wait, and we'll be on the lookout for it. So Timothy, you were born and raised in Los Angeles. Right. I have seen your gorgeous home. It's been a few years in Hancock Park. Tell the story about growing up in a particular home from your childhood. Well, it's interesting. I have to say I was not born here, but I basically lived here most of my most of my childhood. Um, and uh, the house that I lived in from the time I was seven to to 11 uh, or 12 um, uh, went on the market. A couple of years ago, around ten years ago, uh, and uh, and the people that my family had sold it to were the ones who were selling it, uh, and so I just wanted to go back and look at the house to sort of sort of to see what hey was it what it was it everything in my memory had 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 mm -hmm. told me it was, and I just fell in love with it all over again and and uh, was able to make an offer and of course there were lots of offers on the house so I I sent a photo of myself in the swimming pool as a little child uh, saying and it said please let me go home again and oh. so. <laughs> Fortunately, I was Ooh. the one who bought it. Uh, so it was really fun. Uh, I actually have no, I'm not even in that house anymore. I've since moved there from there because I am a I'm a house junkie. I just love houses. I love the process of redoing them, etc. Um, so uh, my my new house is in the uh, is in the the new uh, November December issue of uh, Lux Magazine. Uh, it's oh, fantastic. also it's also in Hancock Park because I just I I think Hancock Park is the best 
area of LA to live because it's got wide streets. It feels like you could be anywhere uh, in the middle of America. Uh, and there's and we've got block councils and street fairs, and it's just mm -hmm. a great place, close to everything, but still very quiet. So I, I, I'm very, I'm very proud of Hancock Park. Oh, you should be. It's got such great provenance and history and architecture. I'm part of uh, the Windsor Square uh, Preservation Organization. I mean, there's just so many uh, beautiful, incredible estates and homes there. Congrats to you. Um, yeah, but how many people get to, I mean, what a hard sell. Ooh, how could you turn that down? How many people say, exactly. hey, can I buy the house I grew up in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, really, really fantastic. I want to jump into something here because you are such an art historian, art design scholar. Every time I hear you speak um, at a presentation, it's never the same thing twice. I learned so much and you're so engaging. I absolutely love hearing anything you have to say about uh, interior design and so forth. So I want to know, I would like in your own words to share because I've heard you tell this. You had an entirely different career that was also incredibly successful and glamorous and you were at the pinnacle of it when you discovered that you might be making a big shift. Can you just walk us through what you were doing versus what you wound up doing? Absolutely. And it's, it's a wonderful story. And I like to tell the story because I think it's so important for people who perhaps are not doing what their dream job is, because I think it's really, it, it's really to me, it's telling um, about the importance of following your passion and following your dream. So I was uh, working in advertising, which, which when I started out was a, an industry that I loved. Um, I was um, relatively successful in it. By the time I was um, 27, I was the youngest senior vice president in the history of Madison, Madison Avenue in New York. Um, by the time I was 30, I was uh, named to uh, run our European network. Um, it's one of the largest advertising agencies in the world. And we had um, 37 different offices around Europe that I was responsible for. I, and so I, I moved to, to Paris to do that job. And um, uh, I loved it. It was, a, it was a great job. My apartment, uh, which I had done myself uh, in, in Paris, um, was featured in, in House and Garden magazine at the time. And people started asking me if I would help them uh, with with design sort of on the side. And so I started doing it sort of as a nighttime uh, moonlighting job. Uh, and I sort of that continued on for a number of years. Uh, years. And then, years, yes. And you were a then, vice president with a lot of people working under yeah, you. Yeah, so at that point, that, at, that point I was, at that point I was an executive vice president of this big, big company. And um, uh, uh, then I got promoted again and became the, the the head of all the entire international division worldwide. So I moved back to New York. Uh, and at that point, I was running 6,000 employees, 197 offices in 96 countries around the world. And what it was, I was so far removed from what had gotten me into advertising in the first place, which was, which was the creativity and, and, mm. and developing wonderful marketing ideas, et cetera. Um, I was basically, I could have been a firefighter. I could, all I was doing was basically putting out fires uh, problems, oh. whether they were clients who were problematic or uh, a, a, a general manager of one of our operations who had been, uh, who left, whatever it was, and I had to replace them. I was uh, on the road nonstop. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and um, I was so far removed from anything that was creative, everything that had gotten me into that business. But meanwhile, I was still doing my nighttime job, you know, here and there with clients who were very patient and willing to let me, uh, you know, not get things to them as quickly as, as they certainly would expect today. Um, and I realized that that was really what my passion was and that I needed to make a change. Uh, and uh, at the time, I, I remember going to my boss and he was like, well, who's hiring you? And, you, you know, whatever, right. are you having a midlife crisis? Stolen. What is this? Um, they, uh, but I was like, no, I really, I know this is what I need to be doing. I need to follow this this passion, and um, so I left New York, moved back to California, where I was from originally, and, and opened an office here in design. And um, I was very lucky um, that early on um, we were, you know, we got we were very successful early on. But what I, the reason I wanted, I tell you, it's an interesting story, is that. It's all about doing what is right for you. And that when you do, 
when you really true and honor yourself and what's right for you, what your inner voice says is right for you, the universe will support you. It really will make it possible for that to be, be to come about. And so that's why I think it's 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 an important story to tell. It's so inspirational because the the first career in and of itself is enough for one lifetime, but you were true to yourself and you took a huge gamble, not really because you were already doing it for years, but you know, it's, it's just a lesson. I I truly believe I I second whatever you say um, on this topic, because I think that creative people often um, not that kind of story, but um, often start in one thing and then wind up in the thing that they really truly should be doing. But the impetus was to explore it. Um, and then, you know, you got there and it wasn't, you were there and it wasn't what you had planned it being and you were being fed by this art. And you know, what's interesting, particularly in design, I think what's so great about design, one of the reasons I love it so much is that everything you've done before, actually you bring to design and it makes you that much better a designer. So we actually make a point of hiring people who have had other careers so we've currently got a, a, a former talent agent we've had a uh, a goldman sachs trader we've had a, a brain surgeon we i mean we literally all across a, a professional wow. broadway, dan- broadway dancer um they and they all bring something to this their their new lives as designers that make them even better designers so isn't that uh, again, fabulous you're giving them the opportunity to live their dream. I, I love that. And that was one of my questions I wanted to ask you, and I think you've answered it, but please expand upon it. What in your advertising background and that success helped feed the success? It surely was an advantage um, in starting your next business. Well, I, so I, great question. Uh, I, I think that, the Jennifer, the, the specific things that I took away from my background in, in marketing and advertising was First is the importance of really understanding the customer, understanding your client, understand, really understanding what they're looking for, what they want. So we actually even have a whole, a whole three or four hour process that we do after we've signed a client where we actually get to know them, uh, get to know really what they like and equally importantly, get to know what they don't like. Mm-hmm. Because what uh-huh. happens is if you find out what they don't like early on and then you never show them things that they don't like, they are going to think after the second or third meeting, my gosh, this person really understands me. They totally get me because you're just simply not showing what they don't like. It's an easy thing to take off the table. No misses, like, only hits. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's, and what that does is um, that, that starts to develop a sense of trust because they feel like, oh, they understand me. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I got from my background in marketing um, is the importance of standing for something. Um, You know, there are so many designers who try to be all things to all people. And um, I came out very early on saying, I want to be known for what we call comfortable elegance. So that no matter how beautiful a room is, it's not really successful if it's not also comfortable. And there's not just the physical aspect of comfort, which is an obvious one, but there's psychological and there are practical aspects of comfort. So it's exploring all of those things. And I remember that um, very early into my career, we were named the AD100. Um, and they actually talked about in this in this, par- this paragraph where they're describing our work was that uh, that said, uh, Timothy believes that uh, that the most beautiful room is not really successful if it's not also comfortable and livable. And as if that was sort of some sort of weird, strange landmark thought is that a room should have both beauty imagine. and comfort. Yeah, imagine that. Um, imagine, but, uh, it has to be functional then, and comfortable. Hmm. Yes, until then, it, no one- You're really, onto something. Really, they hadn't focused on that. You know, they were just focusing yeah. on, gee, this is a gorgeous room, but how do you really live in that room? So it was that d- desire to develop a positioning, which included comfort uh, in all of its different forms um, that helped me, that helped establish the business we became. Uh, So it was that positioning um, of what we were going to stand for. And then I think the third and and perhaps equally important is this aspect of what I learned of running a business with 6,000 employees and 197 offices um, is the importance of having solid business practices. Because There are lots of designers who are incredibly talented, but don't always have the best business practices. And um, the business side, the business side of our business is of our industry is equally importantly. It's 
it's it's certainly you've got to have the beautiful creative design and concept, but you've got to be able to execute that. You've got to be able to execute it in a timely fashion, to the, with the level of quality that's expected, and uh, and with the costs that are that have been been projected. And so I think that if you can deliver on all three of those, um, then you you really have a, a really strong business. Yeah, and you do. One of the things I uh, I always notice about every design that I have seen, including your home, um, is that it is it's so elegant, and yet you look and there's just layers, beautiful layers of textures, whether it's wall coverings, fabrics, and art, and artifacts and antiques, and there's just it's like, but it's all seamless. So you're enveloped in it and then you look around and you're comfortable and cozy in it, but there's just such a always layers um, to your designs. And I, I so love it and appreciate um, well, thank you. the but elegance. You know, it's thank you for everything. What's interesting about, um, about layering and it's something that, that people um, don't often think about is that a, a, a minimalist room looks its best when there's no one in it and none of your things are none of your daily life things are in it the newspaper the dog leash the phone <laughs> the computer um all those things um if you're living in a really minimalist house those that house is not designed for those things to be a part of them uh, whereas if you're living in a house that is more layered to start with those things just filter in and they just become another item that, as a part of the home of the whole mix um, so it makes it easier to live in a home that is more layered Excellent. I agree with that because the, the 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 previous version um, is hard. Yeah, really hard for me. Um, the dog leash, computer, all of it. Uh, who who doesn't have all those things? So all things started in France for you, really. That inspiration. Can we? Is it safe to call you? It's not a bad name. A Francophile, loving things I am all in French. Yeah, I am indeed a Francophile. You know, it's interesting. I I I am first and foremost an American. I am always. I'm so proud of being an American. Um, and it's, it's always the country I would choose to be the citizen of. But I will say I actually feel more at home in France. Um, I feel um, there's something in it that just stirs my soul in a way that I don't get here. Um, and I think it was moving to France. It was that exposure to history, to culture, to art. Uh, uh, all those things are truly a part of the French DNA uh, in a way that that it's not here. And it's frankly, just because we're a younger country um, and we don't have all that as a part of our, uh, a part of our, of our historical background. Um, but I think those are the things that I just, I particularly love. Uh, and what helped form me as a, as a, as a designer was, was living in France and that, and just that exposure to all of that right. on a daily basis. I actually have come to call myself or think of myself as a chateau holic. I, I love chateaus. It's, uh, I've actually uh, owned four chateaux and that the book was actually on my third chateau. Um, uh, we, uh, I love the process of redoing the chateaus, both for myself and for clients. Right now we're working on uh, chateaus for a couple of different clients. Um, I love the process because you, uh, you start to take apart this old building that has been, was built for a certain way of life, whether it was in the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, life was different then. And so those, those, struck, those buildings were structured to accommodate a different way of life. Right. What I love about doing them is the taking them down, understanding what was there, what was the history of them, but then figuring out how do I make it appropriate for life in the 21st century? You know, how do you change something where uh, the kitchens were always in another building for fear of a fire that would burn down the, the building? And how do you put a kitchen into a structure that, that never had one and still make it feel appropriate to that building? Um, so it's, it's, it's that, whole, that whole process that I love because you, um, it, it's, it's, it, it, you can't take a cookie cutter approach because you have to accommodate the structure itself. You have to accommodate, gee, the, the walls may be six foot thick stone that you can't just put plumbing through. Right. Um, so it's this aspect of um, really trying to figure out how to make it work. And then it's the process also of taking away, stripping away and discovering different layers of paint, different layers of wallpaper. So you start right. to see, it's really, I think of it almost as an act of archeology span because you start to see how people th thought and lived right. at different periods of right. time. So it, to me, it's just, it's just an ex a wonderful experience. Tell us about the first one that became a book. It's a stunning book, Before and After. 
So I've actually had uh, four chateaus. That was my third chateau. Um, and, and I actually did a book on that chateau, Chateau de Grand Lucé, which has now become one of the top boutique hotels in the world. And i am uh, got a new chateau, the Chateau Chevalry, which I'm working on a, uh, a new book for as well, which is going to be called uh, Town and Country France, which will focus on my life in, in Paris and, and the new chateau. Oh, can't wait for that one. I have the first one, the before and afters. Your restoration work is incredible and the stories that go with it. And then you have another book, a second book in between the first and the third. Please tell us about this. It goes right to what we were just talking about, your style. So, so that book was called The New Elegance. And it really is about um, how to live beautifully and elegantly, but comfortably today. And it really breaks out all the different components. There's a lot of I don't want to say how to, but there are a lot of sections in it that say, here's how you can apply what you just learned in this chapter to your own home. And it's been, it actually, it was amazingly successful. It went into a reprint after just three weeks uh, of being on the market. I'm, I, I'm a proud owner of a signed copy of that one too. Absolutely okay. gorgeous. And I will be sure and get the third one. This is by Rizzoli and available oh, online. Yes. And okay. So you are so busy. You have multiple collections with multiple luxury brands and they're varied. They're quite a range. If you would um, just tell everybody some of them. I don't know. I've hey, lost track. Here, quite a few. So, you know, one of the things that I love about doing the product development like that with designs is that it actually mixes my former career in marketing and my new, uh, new career in design. So I have a, a, a a wonderful collection of fabrics and uh, rugs with Schumacher. Uh, we've had two different collections and I'm working on a third, which will be coming out in 23. Um, I've got a collection with perennials of both uh, uh, solution dyed acrylic uh, fabrics and rugs for them. Uh, that collection came out uh, two years ago and the, a new collection will be coming out in uh, January of 24. Um, I've got a collection of trims, um, for Samuel Sons, which is also in the PDC. Uh, that collection uh, is actually named after my, my current chateau. And I've got a new collection coming out in 23 for that. Um, I've got a collection with um, a THG uh, Plumbing Paris, which is sort of the, the luxury end of, of, of plumbing. And it's going to be, uh, it's, it's at the, it's at the uh, uh, PDC as well. And I've got a collection of wallpapers with Fromental, which is at Thomas Lavin, Lavin in the PDC. Uh, in the and PDC. again, beautiful. You're a walking documents. commercial so. for products. You're in every single showroom. Well, I'm a, pro I'm a <laughs> walking a commercial for the PDC because I love yes. the PDC. I just think the PDC <laughs> is one of the best design centers in the world. And Absolutely. I'm, I'm so down. happy it's ours. <gasps> yes. And it's in the neighborhood. Yes. Yay. Um, wow. So yeah, that's a lot. I, I lost count, but congratulations Thank to you. you. That's, I love that's it. a tremendous love amount of work and the designs are beautiful. Thank um, you. so really congratulations Thank and, you. and, um, and looks like it's going to be another bright year for you. I have a question for you in parting. Um, what advice from all your experience and insight, you've given some great wisdom and pieces of advice throughout our talk here, but what would you tell the next group of rising, talented interior designers in this ever-changing climate and time? What would be the single most important piece of advice you would tell them now? Um, I would say that in this environment, um, the, there are the overarching issue is establishing trust with your clients. Uh, and the, one of the surest ways to establish strong trust with your clients is with total transparency. Uh, total transparency of what things cost, how you do your business, laying it all out there. Um, clients increasingly, like never before, can find out any bit of information. They can find out where something is sourced, what it costs, what it's made of, et cetera. Um, so the more transparent you are, the more open you are about all of that, um, the better you will be and the stronger and longer term relationship you can have with your clients because trust is the basis of every good relationship. I am so thrilled to hear you say that. That's so influential. And I really think it's timely. Um, I see in the industry, people still struggling with that. And it always bites them, so to speak. You know, it's, it, we're in the information age. And, um, you know, before you get handed the keys to the kingdom, somebody's kingdom, it's a huge investment. And they've got to trust you, know you, like you, that, you know, and all those things. And are you being authentic with 
everything, including the information of what things cost, because that'll sink you before you start. Um, I, I love that piece of advice. I am seeing a shift in the industry that used to be so proprietary. Um, those days are, are long gone and we're catching up. Oh, such gems. I am so excited for you um, just in, in the new year coming up. And uh, thank you so much for being here, Timothy. Oh, Safe you. travels. Thank you, Jennifer. You're... Thank you so much for having me on. I just love, love you and so love the PDC. So thank you. Always such a pleasure. Love to you too. Thank you. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much, everyone. That's it for today's episode. We will catch you next time. A special thank you to Pacific Design Center. Take care. Thank you.